the U.S. state of Alabama declared that it had seceded from the United States of America on January 11, 1861. It then quickly joined the Confederate States during the American Civil War. A slave state, Alabama provided a significant source of troops and leaders, military material, supplies, food, horses and mules. However, very little of the state's cotton crop could be sold, as the main port of Mobile was closed off by the U.S. Navy. Secession At the Alabaman Secession Convention in January 1861, one of the convention's members stated that the state's declaring of secession was motivated by slavery. The question of slavery is the rock upon which the old government split. It is the cause of secession. G. T. Yelverton, speaking to the Alabama Secession Convention, in an 1861 speech delivered by Alabaman politician Robert Hardy Smith. Smith stated that the state of Alabama had declared its secession from the United States over the issue of slavery, which he referred to as the Negro Quarrel. In the speech, he praised the Confederate Constitution for its un-euphemistic protections of the right to own slaves. We have dissolved the late Union chiefly because of the Negro Quarrel. Now, is there any man who wished to reproduce that strife among ourselves? And yet does not he, who wished the slave trade left for the action of Congress, see that he proposed to open a Pandora's box among us and to cause our political arena again to resound with this discussion? Had we left the question unsettled, we should, in my opinion, have sown broadcast the seeds of discord and death in our Constitution. I congratulate the country that the strife has been put to rest forever, and that American slavery is to stand before the world as it is, and on its own merits. We have now placed our domestic institution, and secured its rights unmistakably, in the Constitution. We have sought by no euphony to hide its name. We have called our negroes, slaves, and we have recognized and protected them as persons and our rights to them as property. Robert Hardy Smith, an address to the citizens of Alabama on the Constitution and laws of the Confederate States of America. Upon declaring its secession from the United States, Alabama adopted a new state constitution. In it, it forbade the emancipation of slaves by the state itself, or by any other country, such as the United States of America. No slave in this state shall be emancipated by any act done to take effect in this state, or any other country. Article 4, Section 1, Constitution of the State of Alabama. Alabama joins the war effort. Antebellum Governor Andrew B. Moore energetically supported the Confederate war effort. Even before hostilities began in April 1861, he sees U.S facilities, sent agents to buy rifles in the Northeast, and scoured the state for weapons. Despite some resistance in the northern part of the state, Alabama joined the Confederate States of America. Congressman Williamson R. W. Cobb, a unionist, pleaded for compromise. He ran for the first Confederate Congress but was soundly defeated. The new nation brushed Cobb aside and set up its temporary capital in Montgomery and selected Jefferson Davis as president. In May the Confederate government abandoned Montgomery before the sickly season began and relocated in Richmond once Virginia had declared that it had seceded. Some idea of the severe internal logistics problems the Confederacy faced can be seen by tracing Davis's journey to Montgomery from his home in Mississippi, the next state over. From his plantation on the river, he took a steamboat down the Mississippi to Vicksburg, boarded a train to Jackson, where he took another train north to Grand Junction, then a third train east to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and a fourth train to Atlanta, Georgia. Yet another train took Davis to the Alabama border, where a final train took him to Montgomery. As the war proceeded the Union seized the Mississippi River, burned trestles and railroad bridges, and tore up track. The frail Confederate railroad system faltered and virtually collapsed for want of repairs and replacement parts. Military endeavors 
Alabama was not the scene of any significant military operations, yet the state contributed about 120,000 men to the Confederate service. Practically all the white population capable of bearing arms. Most were recruited locally and served with men they knew, which built esprit and strengthened ties to home. Medical conditions were severe, about 15% died of disease, and 10% from battle. Alabama had few well-equipped hospitals, but it had many women who volunteered to nurse the sick and wounded. Soldiers were poorly equipped, especially after 1863, and often resorted to pillaging the dead for boots, belts, canteens, blankets, hats, shirts and pants. Uncounted thousands of slaves worked with Confederate troops. They took care of horses and equipment, cooked and did laundry, hauled supplies, and helped in field hospitals. Other slaves built defensive installations, especially those around Mobile. They graded roads, repaired railroads, drove supply wagons, and labored in iron mines, iron foundries and even in the munitions factories. As they were enslaved, the labor of slaves was involuntary. Their unpaid labor was forcibly impressed from their unpaid masters. About 10,000 slaves escaped and joined the Union Army, along with 2,700 white men who had remained loyal to the Union. 39 Alabamians attained the rank of general or admiral, most notably Lieutenant General James Longstreet and Admiral Raphael Semmes. Josiah Gorgas was the chief of ordnance for the Confederacy. He located new munitions plants in Selma that employed 10,000 workers until Union raiders in 1865 burned down the factories. The Selma arsenal made most of the Confederacy's ammunition. The Selma Naval Ordnance Works manufactured artillery, turning out a cannon every five days. The Confederate Naval Yard built ships and was noted for launching the CSS Tennessee in 1863 to defend Mobile Bay. Selma's Confederate Nitra Works procured nitre for gunpowder from limestone caves. When supplies were low, it advertised for housewives to save the contents of their chamber pots. Urine was a rich source of organic nitrogen. Alabama soldiers fought in hundreds of battles. The state's losses at Gettysburg were 1,750 dead plus even more captured or wounded. The famed Alabama Brigade took 781 casualties. In 1863 federal forces secured a foothold in northern Alabama in spite of spirited opposition from Confederate cavalry under General Nathan B. Forrest. Mobile Bay. On April 12, 1865, three days after the surrender of Robert E. Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, the city of Mobile surrendered to the Union Army to avoid destruction following the Union victories at the Battle of Spanish Fort and the Battle of Fort Blakely. The McGee Farm, north of Mobile, was the site of preliminary arrangements for the surrender of the last Confederate States Army east of the Mississippi River. Confederate General Richard Taylor negotiated a ceasefire with Union General Edward Canby at the House on April 29, 1865. Taylor's forces, comprising 47,000 Confederate troops serving in Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana, were the last remaining Confederate force east of the Mississippi River. Union occupation of northern Alabama, after the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers were taken, Union forces temporarily occupied northern Alabama until the fall of Nashville allowed permanent occupation of counties north and west of the Tennessee River, while the Union blockade applied pressure in the southern part of the state. Unionists in northern Alabama There was a small loyalist element in northern Alabama. It needed Union military support to survive. On the one hand, with Union troops present, southern Unionists were finally able to come out of hiding, join the Union army if desired, and care for their families, who were now protected from Confederate partisans. On the other hand, Union troops doubled the amount of regional foraging compared to the Confederates. Federal foragers in northern Alabama were, for the most part, an adventurous group that were aided by loyal Unionists. 
and they took all they needed for their vast forces, often raiding farms and homes previously struck by the Confederates. Before the arrival of federal troops, local Unionist resistance networks were based on underground cells that aided pro-Union loyalists by means of finances, contacts, supplies, and much-needed local intelligence. Recruits from Alabama who had joined Union regiments used their familiarity with the social network and physical geography of the home front to locate, rescue, and recruit beleaguered Unionists still behind Confederate lines. Loyalists were given assurance of safety and a job if they were to give the U.S. forces supplies, information, contacts, and money. Some loyalists were drafted, and some were volunteers. White Unionists used the army as a tool to defeat the forces threatening to destroy the old Union, and the families and neighborhoods along with it. The most well-known unit composed entirely of Alabama Unionists was the 1st Alabama Cavalry Regiment. Of the 2,678 white Alabamians who enlisted in the Union Army, 2,066 served in it. Union partisans were motivated by a sense of duty and obligation to the Union cause and a need to protect their family and Unionist friends. They were also motivated by a desire for vengeance for all the wrongs they had suffered at Confederate hands throughout the war. Unionist guerrilla bands were typically fairly compact, numbering between 20 and 100 men. They were independently organized, but were loosely associated and actively supported by occupying Union forces. Their missions included acting as spies, guides, scouts, recruiters behind enemy lines and anti-guerrilla fighters to protect Union forces and infrastructure. Women not only did the Union blockade shut down exports, it blocked essential imports. Women had charge of making do. They cut back on purchases, brought out old spinning wheels and enlarged their gardens with peas and peanuts to provide clothing and food. Their households were severely hurt by inflation in the cost of everyday items and the shortages of food, fodder for the animals, and medical supplies for the wounded. Jonathan Weiner studied the census data on plantations in Black Belt counties, 1850-70 and found that the war did not drastically alter the responsibilities and roles of women. The age of the groom went up as younger women married older planters, and birth rates dropped sharply during 1863-68. However, he finds that plantation mistresses were not more likely to operate plantations than in earlier years. Nor was there a lost generation of women without men. The women of the Alabama Unionists helped with long-distance communication networks, and they were able to move freely from town to town because of their gender. When these women lost their husbands, it was often a struggle to survive, and they were completely ostracized by the pro-Confederate women. Story finds that their intense loyalty to kin, neighbors, and nation strengthened the Unionists against Confederate ideological pressures so much that they prefer to abandon the slave system and their high socioeconomic status in order to remain true to the Union. Slaves according to historian Margaret M. Story, regardless of the Union's ambivalence towards slaves and slavery, Black men and women in Alabama saw the Union occupation as the surest path to freedom. With regard to Union foraging and the practicing of hard war, while some slaves and free blacks viewed the loss of goods as negligible in light of the security and opportunities, for others, federal occupation brought them loss of even small property and meant increased vulnerability to whatever white people won the war. Confederate partisans Many of the Confederate guerrillas in northern Alabama were detached cavalry units that were used to great advantage in protecting the home front, as opposed to serving in the main army. The primary mission of the pro-Confederate guerrillas was to attempt to keep intact the Confederate social and political order. They assisted the war effort in their own backyards by hunting down and arresting Unionists, conscripts, and deserters. In addition, they terrorized Unionists by destroying their property and threatening their families. 
Confederate guerrillas were made up of four types of fighters. The first half of these were under Confederate supervision, being either detached cavalry or enlisted men fighting close to home. The other units either fought disguised as non-combatants or were simply outlaws looking for bloodletting opportunities. These men were not under Confederate control and were as interested in profit as helping the Southern cause. Unionists in Southern Alabama Not all Union partisans were confined to the Union-occupied areas of Alabama. In the southeast Alabama counties of Dale, Coffey and Henry, for instance, guerrillas led by local Unionist John Ward operated virtually at will during the last two years of the war, finding refuge in the vast pine forests that covered this region. These renegades sometimes worked with regular Union forces based in Pensacola, Florida, and their depredations led several leading citizens of these counties to petition the governor, T.H. Watts, for military assistance against them. Local citizens, such as Methodist minister Bill Sketo of Newton, were even hanged by Home Guard elements for alleged acts of collaboration with these guerrillas. Battles in Alabama Battle of Athens, Battle of Days Gap, Battle of Decatur, Battle of Fort Blakely, Battle of Mobile Bay, Battle of Newton, Battle of Selma, Battle of Spanish Fort, Losses, Alabama soldiers fought in hundreds of battles, the state's losses at Gettysburg were 1,750 dead plus even more captured or wounded, the famed, Alabama Brigade took 781 casualties. Governor Lewis E. Parsons in July 1861 made a preliminary estimate of losses. Nearly all the white men served, some 122,000 he said, of whom 35,000 died in the war and another 30,000 were seriously disabled. The next year Governor Robert M. Patton estimated that 20,000 veterans had returned home permanently disabled, and there were 20,000 widows and 60,000 orphans. With cotton prices low, the value of farms shrank from $176 million in 1860 to only $64 million in 1870. The livestock supply shrank too, as the number of horses fell from 127,000 to 80,000, and mules 111,000 to 76.000. The overall population remained the same, the growth that might have been expected neutralized by death in emigration. Congressional Delegations Deputies from the first seven states to secede formed the first two sessions of the 1861 Provisional Confederate Congress. Alabama sent William Parrish Chilton, Sr., Jabez Lamar Monroe Curry, Thomas Fern, Stephen Fowler Hale, David Peter Lewis, Colin John McRae, John Gill Shorter, Robert Hardy Smith, and Richard Wilde Walker. The bicameral first Confederate Congress included two senators from Alabama, Clement Claiborne Clay and William Lowndes Yancey. Representing Alabama in the House of Representatives were Thomas Jefferson Foster, William Russell Smith, John Perkins Rawls, Jabez Lamar Monroe Curry, Francis Strother Leon, William Parrish Chilton, Sr., David Clopton, James Lawrence Pugh, Edmund Strother Dug and Alabama's two senators in the Second Confederate Congress were Robert Jemison, Jr. and Richard Wilde Walker. Representatives were Thomas Jefferson Foster, William Russell Smith, Marcus Henderson Cruikshank, Francis Strother Leon, William Parrish Chilton, Sr., David Clopton, James L. Pugh, and James Shelton Dickinson. Congress refused to seat Representative Alex W. R. W. Cobb because he was an avowed Unionist, therefore his district was not represented. 